Yo, welcome back to the HQ. I hope you missed this place as much as I did. We're back with a really, really good episode today. Nicholas, Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. And I'm gonna break some good stuff down for you. This arguably might be the most valuable video that I'll put that I might have ever put out on this channel. So here's what I did. I looked at guys whose contracts are expiring at the end of this year, along with guys who are probably retiring, to break down guys who will have really good outlooks or you know i'm just breaking down the outlooks overall it doesn't have to be good or bad whatever it is for next year so this is going to be valuable to anyone hearing this but it's super valuable to those in keeper leagues those in dynasty leagues where you're drafting guys this year based on maybe what they're going to do next year or the year after that so we went really in depth on this man i dug deep for this one i think you guys are going to enjoy the shit out of it so if you do make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new hit that thumbs up button right down below and this is a really good one and uh, I actually helped myself in this one because I'm in a lot of keeper leagues. So I'm excited to bring it to you. One other announcement that I'm not sure if all of you guys uh, watched my tight end ranking video, which I'll link up here. So what I am doing this summer is I'm going to host a live fantasy football draft with my subscribers only. It's going to be nine of you guys, one of me. I would do more if I could. We're going to come together. We're going to rent out an Airbnb in New York City, a nice one that sleeps 10 people comfortably. We are going to kick it from Friday to Sunday. We're going to hang out. We're going to talk life. We're going to talk football especially fantasy football we're gonna talk anything you want to talk us 10 will be together this will be a higher priced ticket a higher priced product there is a, a decent amount of interest already so the slots are going quick so if you are interested make sure you listen to this this will be all inclusive i'm talking about the ticket that you're paying for will include all food will include all drinks for the weekend at the airbnb out at restaurants out at bars we're definitely doing a nice little saturday uh all you can drink marg brunch because i know the best spots in the city we're gonna kick off friday night with probably a nice steakhouse or a sports bar dinner i don't have all the itinerary down to it's down to a key down to a t damn i'm getting nervous just pitching this to you guys because uh this is my baby i'm looking i'm looking to change the fantasy football industry no one in the industry is doing something like this so all-inclusive food drinks ubers around the city if you've never been to new york city this is a dope experience this will be a dope experience this is an awesome time to come and visit during the summer and check it out and hang out with me who knows the city pretty damn well because i'm out there about every weekend what else is included the shelter the food the drink we're gonna have a, a secret gift bag a bdge secret gift package i think we're gonna try to get some dope stuff and raffle it off as well to the people in the house which is yeah i might be some autograph stuff i have just so many ideas for this house and it's gonna be super 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 dope so if you are interested if you want to know more details, things like pricing and logistics and things like that, make sure you shoot me an email, nick at bigdogsfantasy.com. That will be linked down below. I'm telling you, this will be an experience that you will not forget and will be totally worth whatever you have to pay for it. So thank you for listening to that and I will get into the video now. Okay, so we're going to break it down position by position. We're going to go, uh, well, actually, there's no notable quarterbacks whose contracts are ending next year. Besides Tyrod Taylor, who will probably be supplanted by ba Baker Mayfield by the end of this year anyways. Matt Ryan signed his contract extension already, so no notable quarterbacks. We're going to move right into wide receivers. And the first guy on this list is Larry Fitzgerald. He is coming back for one year, right? This will be his last year before he retires. He's about 91 catches away from tying Tony Gonzalez for the second most catches in history in the NFL, right? In my opinion, with Fitz gone, this passing game is obviously going to be very different, right? He's been the heart and soul of it for a while. The play here is Christian Kirk. He is a guy that the Cardinals drafted this year. Second round pick, 47th overall. He is a true, true slot receiver out of Oklahoma University. Um, he was all SEC in each of his past two seasons. He was a monster college producer. The best part is that he's coming in with Josh Rosen, right? They were the first and second round picks for the Cardinals. They're going to have a chemistry there, whether it's, you know, if they're both backups or they're both playing, they're going to have a chemistry from day one, from year one going forward, which is what I love. He, uh, he was not a good producer at the combine, right? Which is probably what stopped teams from picking him a little bit higher, but he's got great straight line speed, 4.47. Like I said, he produced in college. Um, really, really good per player profile in terms of college dominator, which means like the percentage of catches and receptions and touchdowns that you have as a receiver compared to your team, which is a very big telling factor in fantasy football when you look at a college player's numbers because it's hard to look at them as an overall number, right? Because teams play different amount of games and you have so many different opponents. So the, the bigger percentage of your team's you know overall production that, that you um, account for, 
is, uh, like I said, a big telling factor. So Christian Kirk was very good there. His breakout age, very young. So Kirk is the play here. He's a guy who, who if, if you're in a keeper or dynasty league, is someone that I definitely suggest um, skipping maybe a round and getting him earlier than his ADP because once Fitz is out, he will have a ton of targets available. Other guys to keep on the roster are uh, Chad Williams, or keep on other guys on the roster to keep an eye out for. Chad Williams, he got some preseason buzz last year, but eventually didn't really amount to anything. He was a rookie, still super young. He's a combine freak, a 99th percentile spark athlete. Fitz said some things last summer comparing his hands to that of Anquan Bolden. Anquan Bolden, pretty good. I don't know how old a lot of y'all are, but I'm old enough to remember when my man's Anquan Bolden was was snatching bodies left and right, bro. He was leaving bodies in his wake. So that's some strong words coming from Fitz who played with Bolden a lot. So Chad Williams, a guy to keep an eye on. Uh, let's see. J.J. Nelson is on the team for now, but he'll also be a free agent at the end of this year. They brought in Bryce Butler, and I know that's going to be like the sneaky play for a lot of you guys. The problem with Bryce Butler is, um, is this. He's old already. He's 28 years old. This is his third team in six years. Dallas had him on their roster. They lose Des Bryant. They are possibly the weakest wide receiver core prior to uh, after losing Des Bryant of, of any NFL team, and they still decided to cut Bryce Butler. That should tell you something. So the people that think Bryce Butler is like a breakout candidate next year when he's going to be 28 or 29, I just think look at the past and, and you're being biased because maybe you've seen him make a couple plays, but if a team like Dallas who has nothing on the wide receiver core doesn't want Bryce Butler, there's just something off there. So I'm not high on Bryce Butler. Uh, he's sixth year in the NFL. His career high in receiving yards is 317, 21 catches, um, and that was four years ago. So that should say more than anything to you. Like I said, Christian Kirk is the play here in this Cardinals passing offense. I'm a little afraid about him in a redraft this year only because Fitz will man the slot and Kirk is not exactly a dominant outside receiver. But next year when he occupies that slot, he's a ah, good play. Next wide receiver up, we got Randall Cobb, Green Bay. He's on that fat contract still that he signed a while ago. Jordy Nelson's already gone, obviously. Randall Cobb will be a free agent next year. So there's going to be some gold to mine there as long as Aaron Rodgers is on Green Bay, right? As he, If he is the quarterback there for the Packers. A few guys come to mind here. First is Geronimo Allison, <clears throat> Woo! who is probably going to get the first crack at wide receiver three here in Green Bay, right? And we've seen him produce last year a few times. He had big games. He's had big games throughout his career, but very spotty, very on and off. Like once or twice a season, you'll see him step up and do something good. The The thing about Allison I like is... <clears throat> Woo! <clears throat> Sorry. Almost every player that goes into that wide receiver three role... Right, if you're put into the wide receiver, wide receiver, why am I having so much trouble saying? This? If you're put into that slot, right, all you have to do is not fuck up in order to get pulled out of the lineup, right? They don't really take shots. Like, there's a lot of guys on that roster historically at the wide receiver position who people thought were very talented, had upside, but never really got the shot. So, if you're the starter there and you have a guy like Aaron Rodgers throwing you the ball, it's hard to mess up. So, I think Allison gets the first crack at wide receiver three numbers, which means that. Um, after this year, if you produce as well, he's a contender to sign a, a, an extension. He's actually going to be a free. Let me preface this: with, he'll be a free agent as well next year, uh, at the end of this year. Um, but he's a guy to keep an eye on because if you can get him really, really late, which you probably can in most drafts, and he performs well, then he'll probably get an extension and could be the de facto wide receiver two behind Devonta Adams next year. Now, the Packers drafted three wide receivers in the NFL draft this year. They didn't take a single one before the fourth round. The first one they took was Jamon, Jamon Moore, fourth round pick, J apostrophe M-O-N, Jamon. Jamon Lee, Jamon Lee. Jamon Moore, fourth round pick, 133rd overall, six foot three, 205 pounds, good size. He's out of Missouri, Missouri. Um, he's, a good he's a good prospect. He's my favorite of the three that they signed. He measured really well at the Combine. Um, he produced really well in college. He's a field stretcher, but also a, a good all-around wide receiver. So he checks checks basically all the all the uh, check boxes that you would need for a wide receiver to succeed in Aaron Rodgers' offense. 93rd percentile spark score, 71st in burst, 97th agility, 98th in catch radius. Um, so I'll get back to more on, more on Jamon Moore. 
after I talk about these other guys. He was a fourth round pick more. Fifth round pick was Marquez Valdez Scantling. Uh, 6'4", 206 pounds. So another really long, big wide receiver. Uh, he's out of Southern Florida. He ran a 4'3", 40 yard dash. 97th percentile weight adjusted speed score. He's a little older as a prospect though. He'll be turning 24 in October. And I think this is more of a uh, uh, a play on just like upside and they saw the 97th percentile and 43740. And I don't think he's actually a good wide receiver or a good prospect. So it's not a guy I'm looking to take. I think this was more just like a high upside flyer pick. Fifth round, not a lot of capital. So I'm probably off of Marquez Velding Scantling. Now the next guy, R- Roto World actually compared him to Devery Henderson, which I think is a pretty good assessment. <clears throat> Definitely a less productive version of him. This last guy, the sixth round pick, is the one who is going to get a lot of buzz. That's ESB, Equinemius St. Brown. Um, you might have seen like the special ESPN did on him. Um, he got a lot of buzz pre-draft. Now, he got picked in the sixth round, right? He's a big dude, 6'5", 215 pounds, ran a 4'4", which is 93rd percentile weight adjusted speed score. There's just a lot on paper that would make you say, wow, like this is a high upside prospect. The problem is like a lot of scouts projected him to go into the third round, right? Projected him to be probably like a third or fourth round pick. Every single team passed on him five times. The Packers literally took two wide receivers, the two I named, before ESB. That should speak loudly enough, right? People will overlook it because of the name, uh, because of his size, and because of that, all the buzz that he generated prior to it. But when you're a six-round pick, you do not have a lot of leash on you to mess up. So if he messes up, right, there is no telling um, that his roster spot is a lock. High upside guy, definitely not a guy I am moving up for in dynasty drafts or keeper leagues or anything like that. So. That's the overall takeaway from here is don't buy into the buzz so much of ESB because I know a lot of you guys will. And uh, Jamon Moore is definitely the guy that I would take here. He's the most complete prospect. Overall, this is a a camp battle that everyone's going to have to keep an eye on, right? You're going to have to hear uh, what's happening with the wide receiver three, maybe even the wide receiver two role because Cobb hasn't been great. But I expect it to be Devonta Adams, Randall Cobb, and then someone vying for that wide receiver three spot. So we'll have to see more about where that comes from. Move on to the Detroit Lions. So you have Golden Tate and TJ Jones both set to be free agents next year. Golden Tate is working on a contract extension supposedly, so um, I guess we'll assume that that's going to be the case. But I like TJ Jones being out of the way here for Kenny Galladay. Kenny Galladay is a guy that I absolutely love. He played really, really well last year and flashed uh, a bunch made so many big plays and looked really, really, just really good all around last year um, on, on limited snaps. So I, I could see that snap percentage increasing this year and eating into. Um, I, he should take over basically anything CJ Jones had last year, as well as you know. I think he's earned his way into some wide receiver two sets. I know Marvin Jones is very good, but I think Holiday is just a very good all around prospect. Um, you know, if Jones wasn't there, I would say Galladay is probably one of the top picks to break out this year, but we're not going to go into that. Anyways, Galladay ranked sixth in the entire NFL last year in yards per target, 13th in fantasy points per target, and 15th overall for all wide receivers in QB rating when targeted. Super, 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 super efficient. And for those of you guys who don't know Kenny Galladay, he got this nickname last year called Babytron. There was a guy, a few years, I'm old enough to remember this guy. I'm not sure if you guys are. There was a guy a few years ago. Uh, his nickname was Megatron. His real name, I believe, was Calvin Johnson. People started calling Kenny Galladay Babytron because he's 6'4", about 225 pounds. 4'5", 40-yard dash, 92nd percentile weight-adjusted speed score, 84th percentile spark athlete. Very good in traffic. Very good in the end zone, in the red zone, making catches on the sidelines. He could play outside. He could run in the slot if he needs to. Just an all-around really, 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 really good player. I think he's the real deal. I think he just needs some opportunity. Um, Just another reason to love Matthew Stafford as well this year in redraft leagues because of the weapons. So he should automatically be the wide receiver three this year in Detroit. And I think if he can play really well and push Marvin Jones just a little bit for snaps this year, then by next year... Um, Kenny Galladay could have a really big impact in Detroit. And we move over to New England. Man, this is a this is absolutely out of control. So Chris Hogan, Philip Dorsett, Kenny Britt, Jordan Matthews, all done after 2018. 
Phil Dorsett, they did not pick up his fifth-year option. Britt and Jordan Matthews are both on one-year deals. So, I mean, it's possible that one or two of these guys don't even make it through camp this year. If they don't resign Chris Hogan, that would leave basically just Edelman, 33-year-old Edelman next year, and Gronkowski, who was already contemplating retirement. Um, they don't have a lot of weapons on their team, man. So, this is the part where you Malcolm Mitchell truthers kind of rejoice here. Um, he's the only guy signed through 2019. So the hype has exceeded his reality in every professional season thus far. But of course, again, he's still very young. Um, he's flashed signs of goodness. So if there's a year that you want to grab Malcolm Mitchell in a keeper or dynasty league, this is the year that I would suggest doing it because all of those players will be free agents next year. The last of the wide receivers in this group is Devin Funches, playing on the last year of his rookie contract. So I think with this, um, for, for DJ Moore, right? I think this is how the storyline is going to go. Everyone got super excited that they took him in the first round. Then the buzz will die down and they'll be like, ah, oh, well, he's not in a great spot to succeed because the target volume is probably not going to be there between Funches and Torrey Smith and Christian McCaffrey and Greg Olson. Um, so I think this actually plays to his favor in Dynasty Leagues because people will back off a little bit. But if Funches, it depends on what they do with Funches. But again, this is, this is all hypothetical stuff. This is just information for you guys to kind of calculate. Um, I think it works out perfectly because DJ Moore does not have to be the wide receiver one in Carolina this year. He can develop. He can work on his outside routes. He can he could certainly end up being the wide receiver one, but he doesn't have to be. He has a year of kind of cushion to develop as a really good NFL wide receiver. If Funchess walks next year, then that would make DJ Moore the absolute hands down wide receiver one in this Carolina offense, similar to the Steve Smith, like what Steve Smith basically said DJ Moore was going to be. So while DJ Moore might drop in dynasty drafts this year, he's set up really, really nicely for next year and beyond in Carolina, uh, depending on what they do with Funchess. But again, redraft value, not fantastic. I'm still staying away from DJ Moore until probably like the eighth, eighth plus maybe even more than that round. Okay, before we get on to running backs, guys, my uh, my draft guide, my ultimate BDGE fantasy football draft guide that will help you guys draft better, win your league, whatever you wanna, however you wanna put it, is available for pre-order now. We've almost had 50 pre-orders, um, and I think we're like seven away. So if you are in the top, the first 50 people that pre-ordered it, you are getting a special prize. Once we hit that 50, I'm going to email you guys out what exactly it is. It's going to be super valuable to you guys. And you're going to enjoy it. I promise you that. Um, but the pre-order for the draft guide is up on the website now, which I will link right here and I will link down below. It's like, I say it like 17 times, but it's completely, it's an e-magazine you can get on, on your phone, you can get on your laptop, you can get on your tablet. So you don't need to bring anything else for your draft. It's got all my rankings in it broken down by positions, tiers, my top sleepers, my top rookies, my top busts, my top, I don't know, a bunch of stuff that I'm also not gonna be putting on YouTube or in my vlogs that's exclusive to the draft guide. So pre-order it now before July 1st and you're gonna get a discounted price. As soon as July 1st hits, um, the price will go up. So if you wanna pre-order, make sure you check the link down below in the description, grab it now, and uh, it will be launching probably early to mid-July. I'm thinking July 9th on that Monday might be the, the launch date. So go check that out. Grab it if you want. I promise you it's going to be super valuable. It's going to be the dopest thing that's out this year for draft guides for fantasy football in the whole world. Whew, I'm out of breath. I get so excited talking about the stuff I can offer you guys. For a while, I was like, I don't want to sell them. I don't want to sell them. I don't want to sell them. But then I realized like, it's my duty to give you guys value. I can't look at it as, as if I'm selling it to you, but I'm looking at it as if I'm adding value to your life, right? So now I don't have any problem kind of pitching my stuff and telling you what I want to bring to you guys because I know you're going to enjoy it and this is going to be super cool. So again, go check that out. We move on to running backs. Le'Veon Bell, man, they 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 chicken franchise tendered him again. Again in Pittsburgh. He's getting a shitload of money, but... Um, Given the way the running back market is and the tread on his tires, and they're gonna they're gonna put another 400 touches on his tires this year, there's like a really decent chance that they do not resign him to a long-term deal after this year. Now you look at the depth chart behind Pittsburgh, and it's pretty much non-existent outside of James Conner. He was a third round third round pick last year out of the University of Pittsburgh. Spells backup. He's a big back, 6'1, 230 to 235. He's not a phenomenal athlete. He's more of a bruiser, but he can take the workload if he needs to. He can catch the ball if he needs to. 
Um, he only had 32 carries last year in 14 games, so he was not used whatsoever. If you want to take that sample size, he ran for four and a half yards per carry. I, you know, learning from ma many, many, many lessons that sample sizes like that, <coughs> Felix Jones, <coughs> Julius Randle, small sample sizes with running backs rarely, rarely, rarely ever work out in terms of a positive analysis. So four and a half yards per carry on 32 carries, wouldn't look into it. What is a bit concerning, like if Le'Veon Bell went down this year, James Conner would probably be the feature back, or if not, you know, he'd be an 18 touch back kind of game. Um, what's what's concerning is that he was placed on the IR with an MCL tear last year, an MCL injury, whatever, and uh, he missed the final few games of 2017. He also tore his MCL in college, so we're seeing recurring knee injuries, right? He's, he's young, he's 23 years old, but we've seen knee injuries get in the way of a lot of young athletes. Um, and, and it's happened multiple times. I mean, we've seen guys bounce back strong as well, but it's just something to note and keep an eye on. So Le'Veon Bell, contract ends this year. James Conner might be a guy you want to value a little bit higher in keeper or dynasty leagues. Next up, we have Tevin Coleman. This is a really good one for you guys. This is kind of an under the radar guy uh, that... The, this section is going to be good. We'll put it that way. So Tevin Coleman is on the last year of his rookie deal. He will be a free agent next summer. He is someone that I suggest everybody take in their keeper or dynasty league minimum one, probably two, possibly three rounds earlier than he should be going. Because they gave Devonta Freeman a big contract extension already. They just draft Ido Smith, uh, a guy who is a good replacement for Tevin Coleman um, in the, I think it was a fourth round. I'd have to fact check that, but I believe it was the fourth round that the Falcons took, and he is going to be the predecessor to Tevin Coleman. They already have a lot of money invested into the Falcons running back situation. So it's very unlikely that Coleman's going to get the money he demands. And Coleman is going to be going to a spot next year. I can almost guarantee it. I would have loved to have actually seen Coleman go to the Niners next year rather than McKinnon, but I believe Coleman will demand a role like McKinnon will get this year as a pretty much featured back involved in the passing game. We've seen Coleman prosper when he's used on three downs, and I think he will get a featured workload, and he's going to go somewhere where the opportunity is there to be a featured running back. So Coleman um, is a guy that you should value very highly in Dynasty right now because he's going to be a big, big ticket on the free agent market next year. Um, he's just, let me see, he's just 25 years old. He's had multiple successful seasons in the NFL, and he's never had like a huge workload, so there's not a lot of tread on the tires. He's ready to kind of take over as that top dog. He's a big back who, who can run really fast, catch the ball, like I said. So Tevin Coleman's a guy that, that you really, really want to keep an eye on. Next, we move over to the Oakland Raiders. Honestly, I have no idea what to make of this Raiders backfield for redraft leagues. I'm probably completely staying away. But Marshawn Lynch, Doug Martin are both... Um, have one year left on their contract. I highly doubt that they would re-sign either of them unless Doug Martin somehow like balls out again, but I doubt it. Jalen Richard will be a restricted free agent. DeAndre Washington is the only one that's under contract for 2019, but I think by this point, we've kind of found out that DeAndre Washington is not, he's a smaller back, like 205 pounds. Um, they don't plan on using him in a featured role. So make what you want of this situation. Lynch, Doug Martin, Jalen Rashard, all going to be free agents next year. DeAndre Washington might have a little bit more value because you know he'll have a role in the backfield, but probably staying away altogether. What do we got next? Okay, this is an interesting one. Mark Ingram on his contract year. Given the suspension to Ingram already, the four games, sorry, somehow I get a cold. I'm out in freaking San Diego. You know why? Because, you know, apparently it's 75 and sunny every day in San Diego. So it should be okay to wear a t-shirt and shorts. Little did I know, I'm walking around like barefoot in, in tank tops and stuff, and it's like 42 degrees in the morning. I'm getting all types of colds, but you know we got to battle through it because I got to give you all the goods. Got to give you all the goods. And uh, I forget what I'm even fucking blabbering about anymore. I'll shut my face. Oh, Mark Ingram. So he is gone for four games on his contract year. There is a serious argument to make for Alvin Kamara being a top three running back in fantasy football dynasty drafts. Uh, great situation, man. But you do have to keep in mind, Breeze has signed on for two more years, this year, next year. So who knows what's going to be the quarterback situation after that. Um, but I mean, given their depth chart, right, it's hard to break this down any further than Kamara. 
They have Jonathan Williams, who was a fifth-round pick by Buffalo last year. Um, he was slated to back up Shady, but was randomly cut. Then he wasn't even claimed on waivers. Eventually landed on the Saints practice squad, and now he is on their. I mean, he's he's on their roster. So maybe uh, Jonathan Williams will take some of the workload away from Kamara in the first couple weeks of the season because he's a bigger back. Uh, but he's not someone that I particularly want in any dynasty drafts. <clears throat> Um, and then the other video I made with talking about Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara and the suspension, I joked about, like, Boston Scott. I was like, who's Boston Scott? And a lot of you guys were like, oh, I like Boston Scott. So naturally, your boy had to go look into it a little further. So Boston Scott is this, this kid out of Louisiana Tech. He's like, he's a little guy. He's a little guy. 5'6", five, 5'7". Five, uh, but he's around 200 pounds, so he packs a punch with, with that small size. He looks a lot like when, when you're running, I mean, when you're watching film on him, when you're watching tape, he, he looks like he shot out of a cannon when he's running. Um, and that's what I like to see on film. I mean, obviously, you, you don't you don't not like that. Um, great straight line speed, tested really well at Louisiana Tech's Pro Day, 85th percentile or higher in his 40-yard time, burst score, agility, spark athlete. Uh, the Saints took him in the sixth round, so the draft capital is obviously not there, but he's more of an upside pick uh, than anything else. Obviously, they can cut him if he's not doing well, but if he can get onto the roster and compete as a pass-catching back with Kamara, there's probably opportunity there. I don't want to go into too much uh, depth on, on Boston Scott, but Kamara might be used heavily within the tackles uh, for the first four games of the season, and that would open up opportunity for a pass-catching back, possibly. So just, just a name to keep an eye on. If nothing else, an awesome name. Um, and we move to the New York Jets. The New York Jets, Bilal Powell will be a free agent. What I'm looking at here is Elijah McGuire, Isaiah Crowell. Elijah McGuire is 23. He was his rookie year last year, and he showed promise. He, he, he played pretty well while splitting time with Bilal Powell and Matt Forte. He went for over uh, 500 total yards, had a couple scores, and again, he had a very low snap percentage. So that's pretty impressive raw numbers right there. They brought in Isaiah Crowell this offseason as a free agent, right? Here's my thing on Crowell. Crowell is still 25 years old, despite having this really bad 2017. He has two, two, I think maybe even three really good seasons prior to 2017. Again, just 25 years old. It's you know he he's he's an average athlete, um, and he he didn't look great last year, but he's shown that he could play on all three downs. He's shown he's capable of catching the ball. He's shown he's capable of running in between the tackles and on the outside. You know if the Jets get a real QB, if Darnold turns out to be the real deal, um, and if this team makes a flip in which they go from a horrible team into a pretty good offense, it's possible that they keep Crowell as their as their guy, and it's possible that he has another couple of good seasons left in him. So I'm definitely not reaching up for McGuire or Isaiah Crowell or anything like that, but these are guys to keep an eye on because Powell will be out of the picture. No heavy draft capital in these guys, though. Next we have Detroit, 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 Detroit. Amir Abdullah, LeGarrette Blunt, Zach Center, all free agents. Theo Riddick, like, you know, I did ask, I feel like he's on a lifetime contract with the Lions. Anyone else feel that way? I feel like he's been a Lion for 40, I'm not old enough to, you know what, that's the one time I'll make this joke, I'm not old enough to remember Theo Riddick not on the Lions. I feel like he was born in Detroit, in that stadium, running a fucking slant route. It's unbelievable. So Theo Riddick, no, in all seriousness, he will be a free agent in 2020. Longest contract in the history of the NFL. Um, Abdullah... Blunt, Zenner, all free agents. What this means is carry on Johnson. Carry on Johnson, carry on Johnson for Dynasty Leagues is a fantastic pick. I'm weary about him in redraft leagues this year because there is so much in the backfield going on already. Theo Riddick will get passing down work. LeGarrette Blunt might take all the goal line work. You don't know what's going to happen there. But carry on Johnson uh, for a second round pick is heavy, heavy draft capital, especially when there are a lot of good running backs still left on the board. He should get a big load this year, uh, mostly early down work. I don't see it being that much different than how they used Amir Abdul last year, where he got a lot of early down work, but no goal line, very small percentage of passing work. So I don't love him for redraft, like I said. But by next year, with all those guys out of the picture, KJ could be a 230, 250 carry guy. With uh, if, if he can mix in 20 to 30 catches a year, you're looking at it like a really, really solid high-end RB2. So he's a guy in Dynasty that I might consider taking based on the team around him. Let's see. Dookie Johnson. Dookie Johnson. Uh, apparently, they're in contract talk extensions, Duke and Cleveland. So it's very likely they get something done. They just did sign high to three years, $15 million. But you look at the the... 
the dynamic of Carlos Hyde and Nick Chubb, neither of them are known for their pass catching abilities. Nick Chubb especially not. So they need a guy or they really want a guy like Duke Johnson as a pass catching back. I would say they will resign and get him an extension. Overall, I'm not high on anyone in redraft leagues in this backfield. I don't love Chubb. As a, as a redraft prospect, I think he's a great talent and a really good running back. And next year, he will take over that featured role. But I think Hyde is definitely going to be involved. I think um, it's just, it, it's like someone said on the channel, someone left a comment, it's going to be like the Derrick Henry and DeMarco Murray of this year. I think that's a great, great comparison, except they didn't even have a Duke Johnson taking away passing, passing game role. So something to be weary of there. Next up, damn, we got a lot of running backs on here. Frank Gore. The Dolphins' running back situation is a confusing one this year. They have Kenyon Drake, who's coming off a breakout year. They signed Gord, or one-year contract. And then they drafted this guy, Kalen Balaj. Round four, pick 31. So almost a fifth-round pick. So not crazy draft capital. Here's what I would say. If you guys have, are not familiar with Balaj, I would go watch some tape on him. He's built like... He's built... The, the comparison you hear a lot is him to Latavius Murray. I think it's a really good comparison. Um, he's really big, really muscular, lean, and long. He looks like Adrian Peterson, kind of. Uh, but he runs super upright. He is, does not have good burst. He cannot get to the outside. He's not a great in-between-the-tacklers runner. So he looks better than he plays. He's built really big. Let me see. He's 6'3", 230. Super strong. But he plays like he's six foot, 200 pounds. Where he excels, ironically, is in the passing game. He is so good as a receiver, a really natural pass catcher and a route runner. Really, 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 really good. Um, I also want to throw this into here, guys. If uh, if you're listening to this on YouTube or on a podcast, and I know a lot of these videos are long and you guys like the longer ones, but you can uh, increase the speed. You could watch YouTube videos at 1.25 speed or 1.5 speed. You just got to go into the little settings on the video. Or in podcast, you can listen to it sped up at 1.5 speed. Um, so that would help if, if you're not into the longer kind of videos. Just just want to throw that in there because I feel like maybe that would help some of you guys. But um, anyways, here's, here's, I guess, how I see the situation playing out. Kenyon Drake is obviously the RB1 after last year's kind of mini breakout. But he's completely unproven in terms of success, uh, longevity of success, right? So we don't really know how it's going to play out. And like I said, I don't like taking small sample sizes to predict success of running backs. Uh, and it's possible that Kalen Balaj eats into that workload. And since they see him as a big back, right, the, the head coach came out and he was like, we we love what we've seen out of Balaj in the mini rookie camp. He's a big guy who could do it all, who could catch passes. So anytime they talk about someone who could do it all and a big guy and catch passes and all that stuff, something to keep an ear out for because they they envision at least them envision him as someone who could participate on all three downs so uh, he might eat, work eat into Kenyon Drake's workload Kenyon Drake is signed through 2019 so while I don't necessarily be- love Balaj as a player I think he like kind of has uh, a worst case scenario of being the pass catching back in Miami this year so I, I like that I just I don't know he's a guy who who's his range of outcomes could be any he's a extremely low floor play, really high ceiling guy. So he's worth taking. I'm not going to reach on him in dynasty leagues, but he is definitely worth a a pick, I guess you could say. So uh, my suggestion would be to Google Kalen Blige, read up a little bit, maybe watch a YouTube highlight video just to see what you get a feel for. Uh, But it's an interesting thing nonetheless. Let's move to Baltimore. This guy named Alex Collins, man. Alex Collins is one, an animal. Two, signed for one more year with the Ravens. So his contract will be a one-year prove it deal. He had a, a nice breakout last year. 1,160 total yards, six touchdowns on 235 touches. I'm surprised they didn't address the running back position through free agency or through the NFL draft. Um, they are clearly comfortable with what they have on the roster, and that's Alex Collins at age 23. He's very young. Remember, he was a pick for the Seahawks two years ago. Um, before he was cut. Alex Collins, 23, turning 24 in August. Then they have Suck Allen, who sucks. He signed for this year, but he sucks. He offers almost nothing besides his ability in the passing game. And then you have Kenneth Dixon. He's the elephant in the room here. He is the only thing holding people back from loving Alex Collins. Dixon was this, like, prolific college runner. He was just so much buzz around this guy because of what he did in college. It's shocking to me that he's a fourth-round pick, right? And like I said, when, the further back your draft capital is, the less usually the less leniency a team has with you. 
the fact that Kenneth Dixon has got through suspensions, through multiple season-ending injuries, through all this stuff, and they kept him around, tells you that the Ravens really like this kid. I think Alex Collins is a better runner. Uh, but Dixon is also just 24 years old. I, I just, like, I don't think Dixon is a lock for a big role this year. I really I really don't believe that. Uh, it's a it's a battle it's a battle worth monitoring. Any any I think any like sane person would tell you that Collins should be the play here, but you just never know with the Ravens backfield, man. It's like a week to week thing, like the, the shitty version of the Patriots. Um, but Collins has proven that when they give him the workload, he produces. So he is on a one year deal. Again, he's very young, so don't think about Collins. Just because he's on a one year deal doesn't mean he's old. So if he produces this year, he should be uh, a good hit in the market next year. So Collins is a guy I like drafting keeper and redraft leagues. And our last, our last running back. Whew. Before we get to our last running back, I want to say thank you to our sponsor of today's video. That is fantasyjocks.com, the number one industry leader in all your fantasy gear. Any fantasy sports league that you're in, they'll hook you up. Championship belts, rings, trophies, draft boards, live draft boards, if you do that. This belt is so awesome, such, ooh, high quality. So high quality, I can knock your mama out with this thing. This thing is hard, really nice leather. You can get your team engraved on there, whoever wins the chip. Have everyone in your league, if, if you're buying a 75 bucks for your league, have everyone throw an extra 10 or 12 bucks, scoop you one of these and you have it for life, man. Aren't you trying to wear this to your friend's house on Sundays? Just sit there and be like, yeah. Be like, George. George. That's what I would do. You could do that, right? This is a little more expensive, obviously, but a really high quality, nice product. They, they have the rings. They have the trophies. You could chip in even less for and uh, do that for your league. But definitely check out Fantasy Jocks. They are awesome. I've been working with them for a few years now, and we use all of their equipment for my fantasy football league. So this is... Um, the best in the biz, man. That's it. So check them out, fantasyjocks.com. It will be linked below. Thank you for sponsoring today's video again. Before we move on to our next running back, which is Jay Ajayi. Jay Ajayi of the Philadelphia Eagles. Man, I've been talking about Corey Clement, CC the God, probably since the first video I put out this summer. I've mentioned him multiple times, and I think he is one of the biggest sleepers of 2018. So you can imagine how hard my nipples got. I mean, they're naturally pretty hard. But when the Eagles went through the entire NFL draft and free agency without signing a running back, man, these things were cutting diamonds, B. Like, okay, I got to chill. I got to chill. So now, J.J. is on this one-year deal. The only guy laying ahead of Corey Clement. Corey Clement became a big asset down the stretch. He was pivotal on third downs. He was very good at pass blocking. I think he was the 13th overall ranked pass blocker among all running backs per PFF. He was very good uh, in the receiving game as well on third downs. He had 100 receiving yards in the Super Bowl. So when you have a guy who performs really well on third down and you could keep on the field for third downs, that usually ends up equating into more early down work as well, right? Because you're on the field more, you prove what you have more and more. So Clement is in for, uh, he has a floor workload already. Given his size, right, 5'10", 220, he has workhorse size uh, built into him. So not only is he going to be good on third downs, he should be fine running the ball on early downs. He was a goal line back as well. He got a lot of goal line carries. So I just think he's set up great. I, I'm i not going to predict an injury for J.H.I. Jai or anything this year. So um, his upside might be capped a little bit. But if something were to happen to like the this JJ Waddles, I don't understand how he's not hurt all the time. I know his knee's been bad, but he really hasn't missed that much time in the NFL. Uh, if his little Waddle knees give out, Clements in for a huge workload next year. If he could, if he could play well this year, then next year he's in for an even bigger workload without JJ there. Um, you know, this is one of the best offensive lines in football, if not the best. They have a great defense who has set the, set them up with really good field position almost every almost every drive. Um, they did resign Darren Sproles this summer. Which is which is weird to me. I don't know why they would waste their time doing it, right? He, it's likely just for depth and for veteran presence. Coming off a torn ACL, he's going to be turning 35 years old in June. You know, when you're that old, it's hard to recover from uh, 
really serious injuries like that without re-injuring yourself. So I'm not really looking at Sproles as an impact player at all this year or to impact the roles of these guys. So Corey Clement, my guy this year. And then we move on to tight ends. Man, this is going to be a long episode. The first one, this is a really good one for you guys too. So Delaney Walker is going to be a free agent next year. The guy behind him, Jonu, I think I'm saying that right, Jonu Smith. One of the more savvier picks that you're going to see in Dynasty and Keeper Leagues this year. With Walker becoming a free agent in 2019, Smith is the next guy up uh, for the starting tight end role in an offense that should project to be a lot better with the new coaching staff and the young Mariota developing. Smith is a, is a specimen for the position, right? 6'3", 250, running a 4'6", 240, which is 82nd percentile, weight-adjusted speed score, burst score of 94th percentile, 80th percentile, catch radius, a 92nd percentile spark athlete for your boy. He is just 22 years old. He is super athletic. Um, last year, he suffered a torn ACL in the divisional playoff round, but he made 13 starts as a rookie. Um yeah, in, uh, as the second tight end behind Delaney Walker, of course. Uh, he was a third-round rookie last year. Uh, he was picked in the third round by the team, which is, you know, one, that's high ca- that's high capital for a tight end. Two, having this experience as a 22-year-old, getting all the way to playoffs, playing a ho- behind Delaney Walker, is invaluable to a guy like this who already has all these raw measurables and talent um, there for the taking. I think Jonas Smith is in a great position to succeed as a dynasty pick. For I think Delaney Walker is going to be really good this year, again, in redraft leagues, which is fine. But I, I doubt they're going to re-sign him next year because he's going to be 35 heading into the 2019 season. And I just, I don't know. Jonas jo- Smith is the guy you want to roster on every every dynasty league. Uh, and then we have Jake Butt out in Denver. He redshirted his basically his entire, well, not basically, he redshirted his entire rookie year last year. Uh, coming off a torn ACL, which he suffered at Michigan in, I believe, the Citrus Bowl versus Florida State. But who's counting? He dropped to the fifth round in the NFL draft last year because, obviously, the injury happened prior to the draft. He was widely considered a first-round talent or first-round prospect at the position. Dropped to the fifth round because teams knew that they had to wait an entire year for him to come back. Should be healthy. He should be ready to go. He's already uh, getting a little bit of hype, I see. He, he won the Big Ten tight end of the year, both his junior and senior seasons at Michigan. As of right now, uh, this com- this position is completely up for grabs in Denver, as it has been for the last few years. But Jake is, but, but, but Jake, but is without a doubt the most talented and best all-around prospect that, at tight end that the team has. So he's a guy I'm looking to add. You know, you have Case Keenum coming into the mix. And Keenum, we saw how much he used Kyle Rudolph last year, especially down by the red zone. So he's a guy who likes to use a tight end position. If Jake Buck can win the starting job, he could be heavily utilized in the passing game. Now, he is not an athlete like Gronk or Kelsey or anything like that, so he doesn't have that upside. But he could definitely be a guy like Zach Ertz or Hunter Henry, who has upside, who has athleticism, with really, really rock-solid hands. So big fan of Jake Button Dynasty. Grab him on your team. See how he does in the first few weeks of the season you'll probably be able to tell what his role is going to be moving forward and that is the last of the skill positions quarterbacks wide receivers running backs tight ends Um, i want to move into some rookies that might have an impact Uh, this one's going to be a long one we're talking about the denver wide receiver position they've made some heavy investment into the wide receiver position over the last two drafts um, after basically making no changes to their current roster between Demarius thomas and emmanuel sanders right Sanders will be 32 next season. Demaris Thomas will be 31. As reported by Adam Schefter, and a lot of people already kind of touched on this, they have almost little to no guaranteed money in their last year of their contract. So the Den- uh, the Broncos could choose to just completely part ways with them, and it really wouldn't affect their cap, which is probably why they've been stocking up on these wide receivers so heavily. They might be showing their cards a little early with these picks. So last year they took Carlos Henderson, right? He was a, he was a draft Twitter favorite. In the third round out of Louisiana Tech, he's just under six feet tall, just under 200 pounds. He moves r- extremely well after the catch. He's a dynamic slot receiver, uh, which is where he would have played last year had he not missed his entire rookie season with a torn ligament in your thumb. Imagine how disappointing that is. You get drafted in the NFL, you're about to play with Demarius Thomas, Emmanuel Sanders, and then you tear a ligament in your thumb and you have to miss your entire rookie season because of this shit. I'd be so angry. Anyways, um, I mean, missing your rookie season is definitely a setback in your long-term outlook for NFL and fantasy, but uh, Carlos Henderson is just a guy that should occupy the slot there and could have some really good upside because he's a great playmaker after after the catch. 
And then you look at this year's draft. They took Cortland Sutton in the second round, and then Deshaun, Deshaun Hamilton. Deshaun, so D, capital D, A E, capital S E A N, Hamilton, um, in the fourth round. Cortland Sutton is from SMU. Deshaun Hamilton is from Louisiana Tech. Shout out Louisiana Tech, yo. They stay putting players in the NFL. Man, that program is legit. Anyways, uh, Quentin Sutton's a big guy. 6'2", almost 220 pounds. The easiest way to put it is that they're looking at Sutton as their Damaris Thomas replacement, and they're looking at Deshaun Hamilton as the Emmanuel Sanders replacement, Carlos Henderson as their slot guy. Sutton is a big possession receiver. Personally, I'm not a fan of Sutton. I think when you watch him play... He has just used his size to dominate and win everything. He is not good at get, getting recep, uh, separation from cornerbacks, and I think that's something that he needs to work on really heavily. And that's why a lot of people had him as one of their favorite or their favorite wide receiver in the draft this year. Not the case for me because I watched tape on him. If you actually watch tape, you might figure some things out. But he had a lot of trouble gaining separation from um, from cornerbacks. It almost looked like he was moving in like slow motion at times, but you know, from a measurable metric standpoint, he did great, right? That's why he's being compared to Demarius Thomas. That's why he's been compared to guys like Alshon Jeffrey. 454 40-yard dash speed, which is 84th percentile, uh, 97th percentile agility score, 90th percentile catch radius, spark score of 84th percentile. So, with those measures, measurables and metrics and everything, um I'm not just going to write him off because his routes need a little bit of work. Because you look at Demarius Thomas, who when he came in the league, he was unpolished, right? And a lot of the same things were being said about him. So I would give him some time. Hopefully this year he can get some work in and he can learn from Demarius Thomas and see how he ended up developing. And I think it will be good for him to learn under him. So Cortland Sutton is a guy who might take over as a DT role. Definitely to keep an eye on. So I'm just going to read this off for Deshaun Hamilton. This is, this is just taken from Roto World because I believe they summed it up really well. So I'm just going to quote them here, the blurb they had. Hamilton, 6'1", 203, was a rare four-year starting wideout for the Nittany Lions, Penn State, graduating as the school's all-time leader in receptions, second in receiving yards, and fourth in receiving touchdowns. PFF College, Pro Football Focus College, created Hamilton, credited Hamilton with a nation-best 73.3% catch rate when targeted 20-plus yards downfield in 2017. Hamilton tested as studly, as a studly 78th percentile spark athlete before the draft with a with four five two wheels and impressive six eight four three cone time, Hamilton isn't particularly big or straight line fast, but he is a ball skills technician with underrated upside. Basically, that basically summarizes Emmanuel Sanders, right? In a nutshell, Deshaun Hamilton is a guy who wins downfield. Um, he's not like amazing on film when you watch a play. You're not like, wow, that guy, you know. Is, is crazy when you watch him, he jumps off the screen. That's the same thing with Emmanuel Sanders. I mean, in his prime, Emmanuel Sanders was a great deep ball threat, and he wasn't like one of those guys like Deshaun Jackson where that's all he did, though. So he's very similar to Emmanuel Sanders in that situation. So overall, i say there's a ton of upside to be had here between Sutton, Deshaun Hamilton, and Carlos Henderson, and these are a lot of, a lot of playmaking ability in there. So what I would say is do some research on your own, see which guys you like, Sutton was the second round pick, Henderson the third round pick, Deshaun Hamilton the fourth round pick. So that tells you draft capital wise what they saw. Um, and I guess it also comes down to like, will Denver definitely get rid of DT and Sanders? Maybe not. Maybe that won't even happen. Who knows? But it's just definitely a situation to keep an eye on. Next up, we have Traquan Smith out of, out of, uh, out of, uh, what am I even saying? No, Traquan Smith out of. Bro, where are you out of Traquan Smith? I don't even know what college he's coming from, bro. I really don't. I think he was coming from UCF. Wasn't he coming from UCF? V. Undefeated. The real national champions. The only national champions we acknowledge. Let me check this. I'm so dumb. Like, I go into doing these videos. This is a long video. A really long video. Yeah, UCF. Okay. I, I knew I had that shit right. Um, so Traquan Smith is a guy that wasn't really on my radar. Because, like, many, I assumed, that, oh, the Saints picked a wide receiver. Like... No way he gets any playing time. Then I heard a lot of talk about Traquan Smith and a lot of people that I respect in the fantasy football industry, which again is a very short list of people, really, really like Traquan Smith. Um, for Dynasty, if you have patience, right, and you could roster Traquan Smith, I highly, highly suggest that you grab him. 
on the surface, you see Michael Thomas, you see Teddy Ginn, you see Cameron Meredith, you see Brandon Coleman, you see all these pass-catching running backs. But the only guy that I have as a lock who's more talented than Traquan Smith is Michael Thomas. Third round pick, Michael Thomas was the second round pick. Smith is a guy that checks all of the boxes when you look at what he offers. He's only 21 years old, 6'2", 210, really good size, 4'4", 40 yard dash, so really good speed. 82nd percentile weight adjusted speed score, 85th percentile burst, really long athletic arms and hands, 37 and a half inch vertical, so burst explosion is really good. But more than the measurables, he dominated in college, like I said, for the real national champs. 19.8 yards per reception in 2017, 142.9 quarterback rating when targeted, which was the highest in the entire NCAA last year. An insane 71% catch rate on passes 20 yards down the field. And what's more impressive is that he had a 70% overall catch rate with a yards per reception total of 20 yards. So to have a catch rate that high with that depth of target, right, with that, um, with those kind of targets coming in is really, really, really impressive. Great at contesting catches, great at stretching the field. Put up a 59-1,171-13 stat line last year. Uh, what's great is that he improved his stat line every year in college. He got better and better and better, and that's what you look for, especially in a guy who's 21 years old and young and still developing. So I, I just think there's so many good things going for him. And, you know, you look at the situation. So you have Cameron Meredith, who will turn 26 in September, so he's relatively young, stolen from the Bears, gets a two-year contract, $5.5 million guaranteed, which is... Not, not Nothing to laugh at, right? They obviously see Meredith as a player this year. But he is coming off an ACL and MCL tear last summer, which caused him to miss the entire season. Tons of upside, but also tons of downside. And, you know, it's possible that he busts out and, and busts out in a bad way in, uh, in 2018. Then we have Ted Ginn, who is 100% still a big part of this passing game for now, even though given, I would say, if they were both given equal opportunities, Traquan Smith and Ted Ginn next year, Smith would would far outperform uh, Teddy Ginn. But T Ginn was a 64% snap guy last year, uh, but he'll be 34 next season. He only has about $2.5 million on his contract next year, so it's very possible that they get rid of him. Uh, I'm not even sure if that's guaranteed or not. Lastly, you have Brandon Coleman, who actually played nearly identical snap percentages to Teddy Ginn, uh, but I'm not even going to get into Coleman because there's no way he's better than Traquan Smith. So, you know, while it looks messy, I would say, like, Traquan Smith is actually not that out of the realm of producing this year, uh, but just a great dynasty pick at the receiver position. Uh, and the last guy I want to talk about is Mark Walton. I shouldn't even really talk about it because Joe Mixon is going to be the workhorse there for years, but Gio Bernard's on his contract year. They drafted a guy like Mark Walton who basically is the, has the exact same skill set as Gio Bernard. So Gio's going to leave, Mark Walton's going to step in, and uh, if you were okay drafting Gio Bernard, like in redraft leagues the last couple of years, you should be fine drafting Mark Walton. Um, I think Gio Bernard should go somewhere where they're going to use him to catch 60 to 70 balls a game. If uh, if that happens, Gio can definitely be still usable. He's still very young. And um, Mark Walton is a guy who was featured in college. So he's not only a guy who should have standalone value as a pass catcher next year, but I mean next next year. But if something were to happen to Mixon, Walton could take over as a featured back. So, woo! Hope you guys got all that. Oh, man, that was a long episode. And I think we're about to wrap it up. So if you stuck around this long, thank you so much for spending your time with me. I highly appreciate it. Give the video a thumbs up if you found some value from it. If you uh, if you are new to the channel, subscribe because I'll be putting out videos like this. I'm, I'm trying to get a schedule. I think I'm going to do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday throughout the summer uh, leading up to drafts and whatnot. So stick around with me if, if, if you're new. Um, again, if you're interested in the live draft, the live draft weekend in August, NYC, Airbnb, what's up, what's up? Make sure you shoot me over an email, nick at bigdogsfantasy.com. Make sure you're following all my socials. Pre-order the draft guide now. It's going to have so much good stuff like this in it that's exclusive to the draft guide, not to YouTube or, or my blog. So, again, thumbs up if you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you all next time.